Hello and welcome to the Edinburgh University History and Games Lab podcast. In this series of episodes, we will be talking to historians, game creators, heritage professionals, and others about history, games, and the places where they meet. I'm your host, Edward Gafton, and in this episode, I'm thrilled to be joined by Eric Wood. Hello, um, pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the opportunity, um, Ed. It's uh, very good of you to do this in your spare time. And uh, I'm very excited to talk a little bit about the uh, Last Samurai Rebellion. A uh, little project I'm working on with uh, with the History and Games Lab. Of course, Eric, my pleasure. Lovely to see you on. So, for everyone not acquainted with Eric, Eric is a recent history and classic graduate from the University of Edinburgh, and he is a member of the History and Games Lab, and is here to talk about the Last Samurai Rebellion, our first student-driven wargaming publication, and Eric's project. The project is an expansion to the popular colonial wargaming rule set, The Men Who Would Be Kings, written by a game designer in residence, Dan Mercy. The Last Samurai Rebellion focuses on a pivotal moment in Japanese history that has largely been neglected by historical wargaming, namely Japan's last samurai uprising, mo more likely known as the Satsuma Rebellion from 1877. The Last Samurai Rebellion is Eric Wood's debut game, and so we're thrilled to have you on Eric, thank you for for coming on. So we've known each other for quite a bit through the research lab, and so I want to ask you: How was being a member of the? How has being a member of the lab changed how you perceive or view wargaming? Well, that's a, a very interesting question. Uh, well, firstly, being a, a part of the games lab, it's uh, made me recognise that younger people are, are really interested in historical wargaming. Uh, generally speaking, uh, historical wargaming is a uh, well. The common perceptions of it is, you know, like as you get older and you know you get a mortgage and you got your kids and family and such. Those are the sorts of people which are interested in historical wargaming. Uh, but it's great to be introduced to sort of like-minded people of, of a similar age group who are fascinated by historical wargaming and who do want to produce content. And what I really uh, love about the, the Games Lab is it's creating a platform for young people to produce content for historical wargaming, uh, which otherwise would be incredibly difficult to uh, to do by oneself. Yeah, fantastic. That's that's a lovely answer, and I, I would you know say kind of the same things like like yourself like for me it's been so fun to see how many people are fascinated by history by games by the places where they meet as i make it clear like on every podcast i'm more on the game side of things rather than the history side of things that's why i'm happy to have historians usually come in and just you know kind of tell me everything about the history which is a perfect segue into me asking you eric how did the last samurai rebellion start so like are you fascinated with with a period? I know you study you study history and classics, but like how how do you go from studying history and classics to designing a war game based on this rebellion in Japan? That okay. So interestingly enough, um, you know, I was just going about my studies, you know, looking through my emails and procrastinating while doing my dissertation, and I was on Facebook one day, and I was looking through Facebook, and there's a little post from the University of Edinburgh talking uh, about well not talking <laughs> but a little post uh, discussing the uh, the history and games lab you know and i'd never heard of this organization before you know it was a relatively new um organization mm -hmm. uh sorry i'm saying organization too many times eh? <laughs> no worries uh, but uh, yeah so i looked it up i thought you know it sounded really interesting you know history and games well i love both you know uh i spent many and now when I was younger doing Total War, and I've always been very passionate about the, the modeling and miniatures hobby. I've been doing that for over a decade. And I've noticed that on the Games Lab uh, website that John Luca, the founder of the Games Lab, he was posting content relating to war games because he published Crusader States, an expansion mm -hmm. for Lion Rampart, and an additional expansion recently, um, Viking in the Sun. So I looked at that and I thought, you know, that sounds look, looks really cool and interesting, something which I'm really interested in. And I thought, well, you know, I might as well drop John Luke an email saying, hey, you know, I'm really intrigued by the Games Lab. <laughs> Any way I can contribute? And, you know, he from there we discussed possibilities of me perhaps writing an article about, you know, for instance, 
I remember at the time I was studying a module about the Spartans. You know, so that's mm -hmm. what's great about doing a history and classics degree is they can cover all the history. You know, I don't have to um, just focus on contemporary history or, or you know, a, a, a specific period of history, let's say. Um, so I dropped him an email saying, hey, you know, um, Oh, no, no, sorry. And then he mentioned the possibility of writing an article, perhaps, uh, about, you know, Spartans and warfare in relation to wargaming. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned my dissertation. And he said, well, you know, it sounds interesting. Let's um, gamify it, essentially. Yeah. And, and from there, I, uh, that's what I've been focusing on, you know, and it's developed into this. Uh, <laughs> well, that, that's why I'm just now today, you know, gamifying my dissertation research. and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, making well the last samurai rebellion. Yeah, well, it's 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 lovely. You're the first student that we have on the, on the podcast, so I feel like we're coming from we're coming from similar perspectives because I usually have more established game creators rather than someone who who's just having his debut. So I'm super excited to have you on and and to have you discuss everything. Um, if you're watching the podcast rather than listening on screen now, I have some of the images that have inspired Eric or images from the figurines and from the game itself. So you're in for a treat if you are uh, enjoying the podcast on YouTube. But in any case, Eric, I want to ask you, how would you describe The Last Samurai Rebellion to someone who's never played a war game like this? Or maybe even, even tabletop in general, how would you how would you describe it to them? Oh, okay, so uh, the beauty of the Men Who Would Be Kings rule set, which is what the Last Samurai Rebellion is uh, based on, or, or an expansion to, is that it's an incredibly simple rule set. It's very straightforward. You, you can read through it in in a, about half an hour and understand, you know, the the mechanics. It's really um, it, it, it's a really good rule set for those who haven't done historical war gaming before and who want to get into it. It's not intimidating at all. Um, so. Producing so using uh, the men who would be kings rules that there it's very simple um, and that's what I it's very easy to get into so that's that's um, you know the one of the course you know highlights or of, of the men who would be kings mm. and so beyond beyond then the the logic of the game or the rule set. Um, what was the last Samurai, Samurai Rebellion? Again, we see the images on the screen, but like, why focus your game on this one particular event, or is it a series of events? Like, give us some context about the rebellion itself, please. Uh, okay, so uh, funny, the the reason why uh, I chose the the, uh, the the Satsuma Rebellion uh, to be the topic of expansion was because of my my dissertation research. Mm -hmm. That's what it was based on. And so, uh, Last Samurai Rebellion. There's um, actually there's a fantastic little series on on extra credits, which discusses the, the fall of the samurai on, on mm -hmm. YouTube. And they love extra credits. I love it. Yeah, it's it's helped me now and then with uh, <laughs> for for panic revision, where I watch a module of uh, extra credits or such, and you know, it's uh, funny enough, one exam it popped up there and it helped me out <laughs> on ancient Rome. Uh, but with the actual Last Samurai the Rebellion, the way um, the events of the Last Summer Rebellion, uh, it's more commonly known as the uh, Satsuma Rebellion, happened mm -hmm. in 1877. Uh, the short-term factors of it for, for the cause of the rebellion were samurai discontent. So uh, ever since Matthew Perry came into Japan in 1854, the Japanese, um, well, look, the, the main... The, the, the Meiji Restoration this government began uh, introducing uh, policies um, to to modernise Japan because they they were fully aware of you know what happened to China, for instance, with the Opium Wars and how it essentially became a vassal uh, to the Western powers uh, with the unfair treaties and such. So Japan really didn't want to be in the same position as China. So they started uh, introducing well the Meiji Restoration government began introducing. Uh, policies to modernize Japan, uh, how many of these policies alienated the samurai? So for mm -hmm. instance, with the introduction of universal conscription in the 1870s, uh, to have peasant conscripts filling um, 
a role, you know, a warrior role, which uh, which the samurai dominated for, for centuries, was uh, interpreted as a, as a slap of it in the face for many uh, samurai. You know, an additional policy such as the the abolition of uh, the right of samurai to work, wear swords uh, was taken as a great insult. So the uh, many samurai were incredibly frustrated by. Uh, the Meiji Restoration, Meiji Restoration government, which introduced these policies, and they started to rally behind um, Saigo, who was a great hero of uh, the Restoration. He brought in the Restoration as government and overthrew uh, the Bakafu, the Tokugawa military shogunate. Uh, he was seen as one of the great, one of the three great nobles of the Restoration. Mm-hmm. Uh, he resigned for the government in the 1870s because he fell out with um, other Meiji leaders uh, on a decision uh, to... Uh, so essentially, he wants to invade Japan, but uh, the, the government disagreed with him because they weren't... Uh, not, not invade Japan, invade Korea, sorry. <laughs> they uh, a restorationist leaders disagreed with him at the time because well, it's, not, it's not the right time for Japan to invade Korea, not ready yet, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Um, so an incident in 1877, you know, the government was fully uh, aware of the samurai discontent and they attempted to remove weapons from Kyushu, which is in Southern Japan, Mm -hmm. uh, because they, Kyushu was rife with, with weaponry and such and in an area with incredibly high amount of samurai discontent, which experienced, I believe one about around about four rebellions before the Satsuma Rebellion, uh, the government wanted to attempt to disarm the samurai uh, because it was a powder keg of discontent. Uh, But this was discovered by the samurai Satsuma, and what resulted in was uh, an ignition of tensions, Mm. and this in combination with a a supposed plot against Saigo Takamori by the Meiji Restoration Government to assassinate Saigo uh, resulted in the the whole thing blowing up and resulting in iron conflict, and that's just a sort of a, a brief overview of, of the events which contributed to um, well the Satsuma Rebellion of, um, of 1877. Hmm. And so you have the historical context, and you know you spoke about uh, General said it's a gaming fire. How? How do you start? What what's what's the building block of the game? We we understand the historical context now. How 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 does the game come in? How do you start designing the game? What's your first step? Ah, uh, interesting. Well, it's uh, it's important not to attempt to reinv- reinvent the the wheel, so to speak. Uh, so what I've done is I've implemented sort of new rules, for example, to try and. Uh, emulate um, the, you know, the, the warriors of the period. Um, also, you know, a lot of um, historical context is, is necessary. So um, mm-hmm. what I've done, for instance, the men who would be kings, it's got, it's got leadership traits. And uh, what I've done there is I've rewritten the, the leadership traits to fit the period, you know, so it's little nitbits of, um, you know, historical context thrown in there to, to, uh, truly represent um, sort of what the Japanese leaders were like during this time, so to speak. Um, I've also, um, you know, written scenarios, for instance, inspired by, you know, primary sources uh, for the game. Um, so e- each of my scenarios are, are in- in- inspired uh, by primary sources, uh, mm-hmm. first accounts written, you know, during the rebellion. Um, you know, so th- th- there are plenty of new features within uh, within the expansion uh, compared to the original men, men who would be kings. So there's uh, new leadership traits, new units. Um, there are new scenarios, of course. Uh, and there's even, for instance, uh, guides to guys to the uniforms of the periods and such, uh, because uh, and what you know uh, the, the opposing forces wore. Oh, because th- th- this is a period of, of history which isn't really uh, covered that much in detail mm-hmm. in, in the English language. So it's important to make people give plenty of context uh, to, to the samurai, to, to, to the Satsuma Rebellion, because it, it, it's an event in, in the English language which people aren't really 
aware of that much. Mm-hmm. So you don't want to chuck people in the deep end. Um, and and to this extent, do you have like a a list of resources at the back? Like we spoke to some other game designers who prefer to include at least a list of uh, of resources. Do you have anything like that? Do you suggest that people go and read books or materials on the topic? Are there any? Like how many are there in English? Because you mentioned that most of it, I'm assuming, is in Japanese. So how how does that look like? Oh, it's funny because it, essentially this is uh, basically the topic of my dissertation. Or mm-hmm. no part of it because uh, up until recently there have been very few uh, widely available uh, English sources on the Satsuma Rebellion uh, currently there, well I say currently but um, I remember one historian saying that today you know, there was only one um, source which was vi- widely available in the English language in the Satsuma Rebellion and that was an account written by Sir Augustus Moundsley in 1879 but recently, you know, thanks to the powers of the internet, so to speak, uh, I've managed to gain access to a tremendous amount of newspapers from the period in the English language. So in the di- diplomatic concessions, particularly in Yokoyama, uh, I've managed to get about, around about three, four volumes of newspapers uh, from that period. I've just been reading through them. And there's plenty of historical context there in the English mm-hmm. language at some rebellion. And I've also been reading first-hand accounts translated in the English language, which have been sort of um, lost a bit, you could say, mm. uh, of soldiers who, who fought during the rebellion. Uh, and, you know, it's a really fascinating uh, account, you know, reading someone who actually experienced the conflict and, and some of the um, information he gives there and the experiences he details are, are very harrowing. And... Um, it, uh, they're just fascinating documents. Mm. And what do you say, like, the game could even double as a historical, like, artifact or, a, I suppose, a resource, given the fact that it's it's not a widely covered event in English? So um, I believe that, um, well, in one way, the, the project is innovative in the sense that this is a period of history which, you know, historical war gamers haven't really covered. Um, so it is sort of, sort of, you know, um, a, a first in in war gaming, so to speak, to have a, an in depth uh, supplement on the Satsuma Rebellion. Um, would I consider it sort of a, a source for the rebellion? Um, I mean, of course, you know, it's important to have educational elements uh, within the war game, you know, to. to because a, a core aim of, of the project is to is to educate people, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, I'm only a mere undergrad, so uh, I wouldn't be uh, referencing it for uh, any mm-hmm. sort of dissertation work or any essays you're doing. Yeah, but that's that's also why it's interesting, right? Because you're you're an undergrad. This is also interpretation. This is also new research. Um, I want to ask you then, you know, about motivations. Uh, about your motivations for writing this war game. What, what are your goals with this? What do you aim to achieve? And we asked this of, of a bunch of game designers to come on the show, on the podcast. Um, do you want people to have fun playing your game? Do you want to educate? You mentioned that you want to educate them, but that, is that the sole purpose? Well, um, the, the, the multiple sort of um, reasons, you know, why I was writing, you know, um, historical supplement. First, you know, I want it would be awesome to educate people, make people more aware of this period of history. Uh, secondly, it's you know awesome to combine my hobby and, and produce it in a, sort of a, a, a written format, you know. And mainly, you know, it would be great to people, great for people to just able to, to learn the history through war, war gaming and have fun. Uh, so you know, having fun through through wargaming and learning about history uh through wargaming i think that's it, it's a great in, a great and very engaging way to learn um compared to i don't for instance uh, reading a history t- textbook um so you know uh having fun you know and, and educating oneself a little bit on the uh, on the rebellion are my main um motivations for for mm. producing yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's it's similar to what others have said. So like, I I like the idea that there's almost 
a consensus, like there's almost a common goal that I created this um, share. I want to now ask you, you know, again, to speak about sharing resources and share goals. Um, what are the advantages and or disadvantages of using, of basing your pro own project on an existing rule set, right? Like we spoke about how this is built on top of the rules that Dan Mercy wrote for men who would be kings. What are the advantages and the disadvantages for going that way rather than just from scratch, not necessarily reinventing your, the wheel, but making your own rule set or coming up with your own rule set? Okay, so there, 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 there are several advantages um, to coming up with my, my own sort of expansion. You know, I've got a, a lot of flexibility. Uh, the men who would be king's rule set is, uh, is a very basic, um, but very straightforward rule set to learn. It's a very broad rule set as well. So I've got a tremendous amount of um, flexibility in adapting the rules. So what I really like about it is because the men who would be kings is such a broad rule set and covers, covers over a century's worth of colonial warfare, mm. my project, the, the Last Samurai Rebellion, is extent, it's, 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 it's essentially a source book for that period. And it's very specific. So it pairs quite nicely with a very broad um, rule set to focus on a specific event there or a specific war. So it gives, you know, for instance, a war gamer to, you know, a conflict to focus on, you know. And um, another benefit is that the men who would be kings rule set. So I was actually watching a, a, re a review of the, the men who would be kings on Little Wars TV. Mm -hmm. And they were saying, you know, it would be great to have expansions for the men who would be kings there. So in, in that regard, it's awesome to produce um, content which war gamers want, you know. Um, so to answer, it, answer the call, yeah. Yeah, exactly, you know. And the men who would be kings, you know, it is, it is a really nice rule set there. And it's, it's awesome just to have, you know, to be able to create something which is specific for this very broad rule set. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. And, and again, this is a good point to mention for anyone listening and or watching that every single thing that Eric mentions in terms of resources, as we've accustomed you uh, to, is going to be in the description of the podcast, wherever you're going to find it. So extra credits, 79 account of rebellion or the men who would be kings review all of these resources should be available to you in the, in the description so we keep track on of of the things we mentioned because we also want you to be able to access these resources that we we mentioned at least if they're available on the internet for free uh eric i want to ask you what are the main strengths of the last samurai rebellion as a game or like better yet what does it do differently from men who would be kings and or other games like it Oh, okay, so um, with the last, uh, I believe I covered this uh, a little bit before. But so, mm -hmm. what um, makes the, the the last time I rebellion different from the the base version of the Men Would Be Kings, or even just other games like it? Oh, other games like it. Oh, okay, so what what it makes makes it unique is that I'm I'm covering a, a period of history which hasn't really been covered in in war gaming. So you know, that's a, a very unique selling point. You know, that uh, as far as I'm aware, that there hasn't been a a published rule set on the Satsuma Rebellion. Mm -hmm. So it's great to be able to explore a period of history which has been relatively uh, untouched by wargaming. And, and in that regard, it reminds me in many ways to <laughs> rising your dissertation and how you're, mm -hmm. you're exploring uh, a period of history or a topic which, which other historians haven't uh, examined. Has the rebellion been covered in any game whatsoever, tabletop, digital, anything whatsoever? I mean, when it comes to, I mean, it's, uh, I believe war gamers have have covered, uh, you know, the Satsuma rebellion with you know scenarios that created and mm -hmm. uh, that the, the sort of homebrew sort of work, um, but I haven't encountered a, a published, you know, expand. Okay. Or, or rule book to date based on the Satsuma Rebellion. And I'm fairly confident in saying this is the first example mm -hmm. of that. Yeah, fascinating. And, and then in terms of gameplay, beyond the setting, in terms of gameplay, how how do you mix things up? Like what makes it the what makes the last Samurai Rebellion different to play than men who than men who would be kings than other games? 
I know you've you mentioned the rule sets and and the scenarios, but what can you tell us about like the nitty gritty mechanics? Oh, okay, so uh, with mechanics, I've I've introduced you know new rules and such to to appropriately reflect reflect uh, units of of the periods. Uh, I've introduced some some new weapons as well for for units. Um, so, for instance, uh, during the Satsuma Rebellion, the the Imperial government formed shock troops called um, Batoi, I believe, and they were these units, and these units were armed with revolvers. So it, it's great to implement, you know, for instance, revolvers within the men who, who would be kings, because that, that 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 those weapons haven't really been covered in in the base rule set. So that's one example of how you know I'm building upon uh, the men who would be kings by paying a justice to you know for instance that the police units uh, during the Satsuma rebellion who use these weapons uh, and of course you know there's special rules relating to revolvers and such and, and how one can use them and it's also uh, mechanics for of course the Satsuma rebels as well you know based on for instance their sort of heroic suicidal charges of implemented special rules uh, mm. you know for them as well. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, that answered that answers my question uh, plenty. I now need to ask you the question that's like kind of at the heart of the lab, in, in a sense, kind of at the heart of the the podcast. Should games be historically accurate? If so, like, are there aspects of your game or your game design that you've changed or left out entirely to accommodate just the historical context or like what you wanted to do, like? How when where do you draw the line between this is fun and this is historically accurate? And have you like balanced it out or is it more historically accurate than fun if if this is even a consideration that you had? Uh, okay, so that's uh, a great question. So uh, I do believe it's uh, well so of course it's important to have fun, especially mm. when you're when you're playing a war game. You know, you, you don't want to put too much history in there that someone becomes um, bored. Uh, but that's not to say that you know, there, there, there isn't plenty of, of, of historical context within The Last Summer of Rebellion, because there, there is. You know, you, you're not forced to, it, it's not, not forced down your throat, you know, to, to, to read the historical context, mm -hmm. or if you, if you want to read it. Um, but personally, I think it's a great way, you know, just to, you know, to read through it, become aware of what the Satsuma Rebellion is, and um, you know it's important. You know it's, its consequences and such. But the the thing is, the many would be kings rule set. That's sort of a Hollywood style of you know historical wargaming, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, so the actual gameplay and mechanics, I've I've attempted to emulate that in many regards, and it's not just you know a, a very super realistic, grindy um, simulator of, of warfare during the Satsuma Rebellion. But, you know, it's, it's fairly, the rules are fairly simple. You know, it's fast paced, mm -hmm. like uh, the base version of the Men Who Would Be Kings is. Um, you know, there's plenty of historical context there if you want to read it and learn more about the rebellion. Um, but, you know, that's optional. Okay, so so it, it can exist just as a game without context, like, and you know, like someone who just says, hey, I just want to play a game. I don't really necessarily need a context. But for no. those who would say, hey, like, I would love to have it, it's there for them. Well, of course, exactly. Uh, I mean, the, the, there is a, a lot of historical context within the, you know, for instance, explaining the scenarios, you know, what led up to the battles and such, mm -hmm. and context to the causes of the rebellion, why it happened. Uh, you know, there's also historical context to, you know, for instance, the uniform guides, you know, what weapons, you know, the, the Imperial and Satsuma forces had and such. Uh, but, you know, it's not essential to know all this stuff to to play and enjoy the game. It's it's an entirely optional to read through it. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, uniform guides are, are particularly useful for the, you know, the miniature hobbyist, you know. Right. It gives yeah. an idea of how to paint and you know miniatures and which, which ranges out there are the best to use, you know, um, which ones are the most appropriate to to, to reflect, you know, um, imperial and Satsuma forces during the period, uh, you know that sort of stuff. 
Mm. And again, I have I have Eric's uh, models on screen for you for you to to enjoy looking at. As I as I ask you the following question about how like after after the with the pandemic or like after the onset of the pandemic, many players have started using tabletop simulators to play board games online. How did you find this transition from players gathering around the board to now playing board games on the computer? And I know that we've tested the last Samurai Rebellion together online. How how do you find that's that's gone for you, you know, designing this game when, you know, we were still more or less in lockdown? How how has that changed the tabletop aspect of the game, if if it has in any way? Uh just as a quick shout out, um some of the the, the pictures there uh photographed and taken by James at uh, Ashura Moral Terrain, who's been tremendously helpful and with the uh, artistic and creative side of things and producing the project. Uh, but so back to your um, original cre- question based on the online sort of tabletop wargaming side of things. Personally, I really prefer conducting, you know, uh, wargaming and playing war games in person, you know, because it's mm-hmm. a social hobby. And half the attraction of the hobby uh, is, you know, looking at the miniatures, seeing how creative people can be with their painting, um, you know, having a few beers or whatever, and, you know, playing a war game and having some fun. Online, it sort of takes the human element out of it. Okay. But it is, it is also undeniable that the, the online side of things has been tremendously helpful with playtesting because mm-hmm. it's very easy to create a scenario. You know, I don't have to make terrain. I don't have to build anything. I don't have to buy any miniatures to, you know, for the playtesting. And I, I, all the resources I need to conduct a playtesting are online. And I can organize a play test for someone across the country. And it's, it's just, you know, for, in any time zone, really, across the world. You know, and right. it's, and that, 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 that cannot be replicated with, with you know, with um, tabletop, you know, wargaming, because, you know, it's, it's in person. Uh, so it's, it's tremendously convenient, uh, you know, online tabletop, you know, wargaming on, on platforms such as Roll20, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's very convenient if someone's, you know, far away or, you know, wants to do something quite quickly, then, you know, it, it, it's an incredibly useful tool to use. And plus, you know, don't have to clean anything up at the end. You know? Right, yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We, we've been using a lot of Roll20 over at the lab and, you know, it's kind of like the landscape of of the industry, more or less, moving towards hybrid. Uh, we spoke with uh, the creator and designer of Distilled, Dave Beck, about his process with playtesting, and he was like, "We loved playtesting online because it allowed, as you said, people from different countries uh, to to chip in and say, hey, I like this, I don't like this.' So it it allows you to like." It makes it easier for you to reach people who you otherwise would not invite for playtesting. So that's been that's been a boon for them. A hundred percent. Yeah. Um, I want to then ask you about publication. Obviously, you're publishing the game with a lab or uh, assisted by a lab. In any case, how how have you found that process? What are the challenges you've encountered with publication? Obviously, this is your debut game. So, like, how? Just run us through that process of like you have it, you know, you've designed the game, it's eighty percent done, ninety percent done. How do you then move on to the from the creation stage to the I'm putting this out in the world as a published work stage? The the game staff has been tremendously helpful uh, in that regard. Um, I wouldn't have been able to do this by myself for sure. Uh, John Luca, he has you know contacts within sort of the, the board gaming industry. Dan Mersey, who wrote, wrote The Men Who Would Be Kings, he's, um, he's very close to him. Dan Mersey um, is, I believe, um, well, I, I can't remember exactly, but he, he is currently in a, some sort of um, a research fellow at the, the university. He's the there. game designer in residence, yeah. Game designer, oh, okay, there we go, excellent. So we've got very good connections with Dan Mersey, and Dan Mersey knows John Luca quite well, you know, and it's, very simple for, you know, John Luca to drop a message saying, you know, oh, Dan, you've got a student who's writing, you know, expansion to, to the many would-be kings, you know. Um, you know. Could you have a look at it? Do you like it? Mm-hmm. And 
tremendously helpful with, with feedback and says, yeah, you know, oh, this is great. You know, I think it can make a superb source book. And it's just having those connections there is really important in mm. publishing something like this, especially, you know, considering that I, I you know, I'm a, I'm a student, you know, uh, well, I'm a recent student at LOA. And, graduate, uh, yeah. Yeah, and without the support of the Games Lab, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to, to publish this by myself. You know, and I've met people who are publishing or are creating, you know, historical war game from scratch, and they are finding it tremendously difficult because they don't have that support or network to help push their projects through, which, which are which are you know, beautiful. Um, mm. I think this is also a good a good point for us to extend the invitation to any students recent graduates or even currently at the University of Edinburgh to to reach out if you are interested in publishing a game or playtesting a game or writing, designing, anything that has to do with history and or games, if you're interested, please do reach out to either us directly, Dr. Jaluka Rakani obviously is the, you know, the administrator of the, of the research uh, lab, and also to Dan Mercy, who is the game designer of residence. And then, as Eric said, people put you in contact with other people, and it's just fascinating to see how yeah, things things get done, things get published, and it's yeah, it's it's, it's a brilliant thing for us as well. And I, I'm speaking from the lab side of things, but also very excited to you know to be working with you, Eric, and to be to be publishing this, and yeah, to to fortunately become, uh, to hopefully become this resource for students and alumni and staff alike. So uh, yeah, looking looking forward to more of this. Yeah. Oh, you're making me blush. Stop. Yeah. <laughs> Eric, what advice do you have for people like us wanting to self-publish their own games? So you know, you know, not necessarily self-publish, but also just publish. Like, how? What advice would you have, like, especially younger people who, or like debutants in the space, who haven't? Um, uh, yeah, go on. Oh, especially for you know, for instance, those who, who are interested in producing historical war gaming content, uh, content. Sorry, uh, I'll definitely just drop a the History and Games Lab a message because it's a it's a truly unique institution which is there to help students publish, you know, history related content. And it's doing this by yourself, it's tremendously hard. Mm. It's important to have, you know, support and you know sort of and connections which can help you uh publish that content. Something which I found is really helpful with the games lab is, you know, the feedback, you know, how to improve. It was very much, you know, for instance, when you're doing a university and you do an essay, you know, so you take on board that feedback to help you improve and, you know, produce content. And, you know, having all those people there to support you and help you, be it with, you know, the actual content you're producing or, you know, your, 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 your writing style or, you know, play testing, it's, um, it's great to have that within the games lab, you know, and they're incredibly supportive. Yeah, 100% agreed. You know, this is a different episode of the podcast because we also speak about internal affairs in this sense. We speak about the lab itself. So it's, it's, it's quite a unique one, but also I want to extend the invitation to everyone, even outside necessarily the university or it's, you know, it's, it's a reach to do still messages, to do still email us because we are willing and eager to help you know, aid, assist, or even just invite on the podcast anyone who's writing a game or designing a game. So, like, the the invitation to be part of, like, working with us, collaborating with us is extended to everyone beyond the, the University of Edinburgh itself. So, again, hopefully, hopefully we'll, we'll have more student-published work. And, yeah, looking forward to seeing all of the games everyone's going to... Uh, to to design create publish and so on um eric now you know we spoke about publishing but i want i want to ask you as as a as a game designer what would you tell other students or graduates about the process of of designing a war game right like how how did you do it how how do you do it and if i am a student that listens to this podcast and i want to say hey i could design a, a war game what's the how do i start like what do i just take a, a a sheet of paper and a pen and then just write down my ideas how did you do it i find that a really interesting question uh well I, I was fortunate in many regards by having a bit of a head start because 
you know, I was doing my dissertation research and you know, it was a topic I was very passionate about and very interested in. And, um, you know, I, so for, for first and foremost, it's, it's very important to, to, to find a period of history or if you're producing a historical war game, for instance, that you are passionate about. Um, what I liked as well is that my, my project seems to be fairly innovative in the sense that um, it's a period of history war gamers haven't really covered. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's not essential necessarily to, to cover you know, a period of history which war gamers haven't necessarily covered, but try, try and put your sort of unique twist on it. You know, perhaps cover a historical event which hasn't been covered in that much depth or you know, a, a, an individual or, uh, you know, for instance, like John Lucas done with uh, Lion Rampant, Viking and Sun, which covers, you know, the exploits of Hal Hadrada. You know, it's especially for your first projects, you know, th thinking about doing, you know, writing, you know, expansion for a game for, for a first time and such. It's important not to reinvent the wheel and, you know, keep it simple. Keep it simple, fun, you know, entertaining. Don't overcomplicate things. And of course, you know, having a network of support which the, the game which the, the history and games lab offers is tremendously helpful in producing you know a history game or you know or, or related content and such you know um and a network of support is you know it's always very useful yeah regardless Regardless if it's just people who love war games or just, you know, groups of friends, family and so on, I think. Yeah. Exactly. And, and all walks of life, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's important. Um, I want to ask you perhaps a complicated question. Um, and I want to ask you, do you think it is financially viable for young people today to start designing games? And because for many, it is a hobby, but... How do you turn that hobby into a viable career path or a you know a, a viable source of income? Do you think it's do you think young people should pursue this as a career or like as an as an avenue for for making income? Well, I, I certainly hope. Uh, well, it, I believe it's important to to pursue your passions really, because at the end of the day, you spend for well, something like uh, what, half your life working something mm -hmm. like that. <laughs> so it's. It's important to spend that time pursuing something you're passionate about. Um, something we really like about the Games Lab is it, it is an institution which is trying to get people more involved in this sort of, you know, especially with historical wargaming. Um, it's trying to get young people involved in, you know, those sorts of careers, which currently it seems... Or you know, I've tried applying for for, for you know various um, mm -hmm. war gaming companies for jobs and such, but you know, lots of these places are quite small, family run businesses, and unfortunately, they don't have the the resources to to employ you know extra staff. But also, you know, you have got bigger companies such as Warlord Games and such, and you know, I, I'm really hoping what I think would be amazing is if the the History and Games Lab can in, organize or be sort of. Uh, be a leading institution which can get people involved within the sort of the historical wargaming sector and you know organize for instance internships or potentially even um graduate schemes but that's mm. that's been quite optimistic yeah of course you know it's important to pursue something you enjoy but it's also being being realistic you know it's you you are able to produce a war games expansion and do a do another job at the same time uh you know, John Luca does it, for instance, he's managed to produce uh, two supplements, line, line, Crusader States and uh, Hal, Hal, uh, Viking in the Sun, sorry. And he's got a full-time job as a lecturer, uh, apparently, uh, which is a job within itself to really, uh, take two care. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, my, my advice would be to, to bank everything on Producing you know, VR or game supplement, you know, it's um, but it's it's important to pursue something you enjoy. Uh, but also, you, you can you can certainly work on a war game su supplement while um, doing another job. Yeah. There's, a lot, there's a lot of flexibility. Yeah, and you know, like as you say about like graduate schemes about the lab becoming those resource. I I also have the hope that eventually this this becomes a way for us to help students 
you know, turn hobbies into a viable career path. But this cool. is us building, building the building, building the building blocks, setting the the ground mm. for for setting the foundation for something to come. Yes, your your pioneers, pioneers trying at least to be to be pioneers, Eric. When will the Slash Samurai Rebellion be available and what formats will it be available in? Okay, so uh, we're hoping for the um, project to be ready by around uh, summertime, before summer, mm -hmm. uh, this year. Um, formats will be available online and paperback versions as well. So um, similar to... Um, you know, uh, Crusader States and mm -hmm. Viking in the Sun. Yeah. So and, and and of course we'll do all of the the promotional material for it. If you're following us on Twitter, which I, you know I I I think you should for announcements on on everything that's happening, we will promote it on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook. We'll be everywhere on the social medias for for the lab as well. Oh, I love me some free advertising. Yeah, Great. yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to jump into the, like the kind of the final final section of the podcast. Uh, we're about fifty minutes an hour, you know, looking to to wrap up around an hour around the hour mark. Eric, which games would you recommend to our audience? Which games have inspired you, or just the games that you enjoy playing in your spare time? So, what what would you recommend? Uh, again, Osprey games. Um, I do like them. They're they're very simple. You know, um, easy easy to read uh quick uh to you know assemble a force and, and play so you know uh i remember i was down in leeds and i was introduced to lion rampant for the first mm -hmm. time or the harold hardrada expedition uh ex not expedition exhibition expedition yeah yeah oh apologies it's been a long day and, um, <laughs> no worries i'm running in around about uh, you know sort of five percent but uh yes so you know Lion Rampant, that, that's, a, that's a really interesting game. I like that. Um, historical war games, you know, skirmishing games, you know, they're, they're quite big ones. You know, bolt action looks really interesting. And of course, you know, I've been devoting uh, a lot of time to um, the men who would be kings because that is what my expansion is based on. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I really like sort of small, small scale uh, historical skirmish games. I, I think they're, they're really fun. Um, yeah, those are my favorites. All right, yeah, and again, as as always, links available in the description. You know, we'll make sure that you know exactly the games uh, Eric mentioned. Uh, again, to 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 wrap up uh, the talk about the game, what is the biggest challenge you face when designing the Last Samurai Rebellion? What is the one thing that you're like, oh, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm gonna make it, and how did you overcome this this challenge? It's funny that it was actually because when I started the Last Summer Rebellion, it was when I was writing my history dissertation, mm -hmm. uh, and of course, finally at uni, it's completely hectic, uh, especially considering that I completed uh, the final portion of my degree during uh, the pandemic. Um, so you know, access to educational materials severely restricted, mm -hmm. and I was really concerned about balancing out the project and, you know, my, my university work, my degree, you know, which I've devoted four years of my life to, um, you know, I thought, well, you know, it's, it's not feasible to do both, but, you know, just, you know, just, just, uh, simple as, you know, dropping John Luke and Ian, being like, Hey, you know, I just need to focus on my uni work at the minute. And John Luke, who was very understanding and accommodating is of course, you know, your, your, your uni, type, uni work takes priority. Yeah, you know, I got the uni work out of the way. You mm -hmm. know, I managed to graduate. Uh, Congratulations, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so uh, I'm very, very proud of that. And um, yes, and that was just a case of um, continuing on, cracking on with the project, really. Mm. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. So, so it's just that the, the most difficult thing was completing my, my degree and doing the project whilst, you know, during the, the, the stages of lockdown and, and you know the, the whole COVID situation, yeah, bizarre times that we we live in and design uh, war games in. Uh, Eric, I want to ask you beyond the last Samurai Rebellion. It might be even too early to to speak about this because obviously you have to wrap up this project. But 
what comes next for you? Like, do you have an, uh, any other projects that you're thinking about? Do you have any other projects that like you're maybe like working on the side side? What do we, what can we expect from you after after the last samurai uh, samurai rebellion? Okay, so um, the last samurai rebellion that is what I'm devoting all my attention to at the minute. Uh, however, you know the various um, other historical periods which I believe do deserve uh, attention. You know, so for instance, sort of the 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 prelude conflict, so to speak, so to speak. Uh, to the uh, to the Satsuma Rebellion, or the the, mo- uh, the most significant conflict in Japan before the Satsuma Rebellion was the Boshin War mm-hmm. uh, between the uh, Bakafu and the Imperial Restorationist forces. Uh, again, you know, similar to the the Last Samurai Rebellion, I haven't encountered a uh, significant wargaming publication which is devoted to exploring this period of history. Uh, so I think that would be really exciting to to examine, and potentially in the future, um, you know, I, I might explore that myself. But uh, time will tell. Uh, always does. Oh, fantastic. Well, everyone will be keeping an eye on you, and you know, excited to see to see to see your work in the future. Now uh, let's transition into the to the final part of the podcast, and I have to mention that yes, we have. If you've noticed, and uh, some of you will, that we have been on hiatus for a few months, but we are back with more episodes of the podcast as well as new seminars for you to enjoy. So do you know? I do apologize for the, for the slight break and in, in podcast output as things were jumbled through as we were kind of getting ready for for the semester to come. But now we're back in full force. And in terms of the events that are headed your way in the next few weeks, actually the next week, both of them. So we have an event by the History and Game Society, which is their monthly games night, and which will take place on Tuesday, February 22nd at 7 p.m. GMT, that's UK time. This will be a physical event and will take place in the balcony room in Old Moray House in campus, in Edinburgh University campus. I will be there. Maybe Eric will be there, but certainly everyone else from the society and or the lab will be there to to have fun. It's a very informal event where we kind of just play our favorite games. Last time we played Skull, we played Mary, Mary and Mr. Darcy, which you know we had we had the creators on for the podcast. So it's a very casual, relaxed, friendly atmosphere. And if you're listening to the podcast and can make it to Edinburgh, please please do consider making it on Tuesday. Uh, if you're not in Edinburgh, we will have more online events uh, available, more game nights available uh, for you to enjoy. But we have noticed that people do really want a physical event um, for for these games. And as Eric mentioned, there is a a a a dimension to tabletop that gets lost online. So we're trying to kind of cater to both audiences and have online events and then also physical events as much as we uh, as much as we can. As for the next event organized by the lab, this will be Sid Meier's Civilization, Breaking Genres for Better Histories, which is a talk by Robert uh, Hooten from the University of Winchester. Uh, the talk will be on Zoom. This is an online event, and it will be on the 23rd of February at 5 p.m. GMT. Tickets are available on Eventbrite. The link is in the description, and I think we will have it recorded on and uploaded on the YouTube channel. So if you're if you're watching this podcast on YouTube, this is the perfect place to see if the upload for the talk is also going to be available. If you're listening, then do consider checking out our YouTube channel for the recording of the talk. I am a big Civilization fan, one of my favorite games of all time. I'm very much looking forward to, to this talk. Uh... If you have any feedback or would like to get in touch for a potential podcast appearance, our DMs are open on Twitter at HNG Lab, or you can email us at HNG Lab Podcast at gmail.com. Again, this is HNG Lab on Twitter, HNG Lab Podcast at gmail.com for, uh, for our emails. For more on the History and Games Lab, please access our Linktree link where you will find all of our output plus our social media. Again, link is in the description. If you're watching the podcast on YouTube, it's also on screen right now. Eric, where can our listeners find more about you? We have your Twitter on, on the screen, again, for, for people watching or in the description for people people listening. But how how can we get in, in, in touch with you, Eric? 
Uh, well, it's uh, relatively simple. Um, of course, you, know, you can contact me through the History and Games Lab uh, Facebook page. You know, you can drop the um, the Games Lab a little message there. And then uh, one of the fine folks there, such as uh, like Ed, will uh, get back to me. And, um, you know, I, I will answer your queries there. Uh, there's, of course, the, uh, the armchair hobbyist on uh, Instagram. That's, mm-hmm. uh, that's a handle there where I post content on the, you know, the last summary value. And, and of course, yeah, the content is also uh, published on the, the History and Games Lab Facebook page. And of course, there's my Twitter handle as well, which uh, I believe is on the screen and is, is being advertised there. So, you know, Facebook, Twitter, and uh, Instagram, the big three. All of them, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, final word, Eric, what would you like to emphasize if there's one thing you want everyone listening and or watching to to take away from this what is that one thing well there's one thing really is um well don't feel intimidated uh about you know writing a, a historical game or, or attempting to write an expansion or such um especially when the, the, there's an institution like the history and games lab out there which can help you you know produce that uh so my advice is you know you just seize the day you know drop them Drop the games lab a message saying, you know, I've got some, I've got a little project I want to work on. I've got some ideas, and you know, you never know what it could lead to. Because when I sent that first email to John Luca, I had, uh, you know, I, I, I had absolutely no expectation of me being in the position where I am now of publishing my own war games expansion. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, at my age, you know, it's just, you know, I, I thought it's something where I'd, I'd need a tremendous amount of, you know, connections and networking and such. Uh, but the, the, the Games Lab, it has all, all these resources there for you. And it's it's important not to try and, and attempt to do something like this by yourself. You know, it's, it's awesome to have that network of support. Yeah, that's that's great advice. Thank you. And yeah, thank you so much, Eric, for joining me. And uh, we'll see you all next time, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, thanks. The Edinburgh University History and Games Lab podcast is a production of the Edinburgh University History and Games Lab. For more on us and future podcasts, connect with us on Twitter, Instagram, and or Facebook by searching for Edinburgh University History and Games Lab. We should be the first result. Music for today's episode is Call to Adventure by Kevin McLeod used under filmmusic.io standard license. For more information on the link and the license, please check the show notes. Thank you for listening and please join us next time.